Amen. You couldn't hear what Mark said. He's smiling. Even though he's got a mask on. He said, you can see it in their eyes. He said, thank you, Edna. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. I tell you, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Revelation uh, chapter 2 as we're uh, continuing in our series, uh, Seven Churches of Revelation. And again, these are seven actual churches, and so these are messages for those local congregations, and it's a message for us as well. And while you're turning there, uh, something took place in the last week or so. I don't know if many of you saw this, but there was a bus out in the middle of the wilderness in Alaska that was recently moved, airlifted by the, the Army National Guard up there. And the story behind that is there was a young man back in 1992 who was going on a tremendous adventure. And so he just wanted to live off the land and he just happened upon this school bus out in the middle of nowhere in Alaska. And then the story behind that is that one time they were trying to put a road through there and the construction crew had put these old school buses there to be as like dorms, to be a place where workers could sleep. And well, they didn't take all the buses out. They left this one bus. And, and so there's a movie that's been made about this. It's called Into the Wild. Uh, but just recently they moved that bus because people had watched the movie or read the book and they had tried to go to that bus as some kind of pilgrimage and many people had died. Many people were injured. The rescue people had to come and so they said, we're gonna remove the temptation. And so they have moved that bus. I'm not sure where it is at this time, but it's interesting uh, when that happened, uh, end up getting a copy of the book into the wild. And so I started reading through that and just hearing the story of this, why would this young man go like that, just off into the wilderness. And reading that book, I came across someone else who about 10 years earlier, uh, uh, 11 years earlier, had gone into the wild in Alaska. And his name was Carl McGunn, or Carl McCunn. Uh, he was about 30, in his mid-30s. He had been working in Alaska as a truck driver. And he just had this dream. I just want to go out into the wilderness and to take pictures of every all the wildlife that I see. And so he quit his job, got 1,400 pounds of provisions, 500 rolls of film, two rifles, a shotgun, all of the stuff, camping supplies that he would need. And he had this guy fly him into this uh, unnamed lake in Alaska. And so it was one of those pontoon boats that has to land and he has to carry everything. And so he sets up camp and everything's going well. In fact, at one point he was sitting there and he saw he had all these shotgun shells. He thought, man, I don't need all these shotgun shells. So he threw them in the lake for whatever reason. He just threw them in the lake because he kept a, a diary. But there was one problem that Carl McCunn failed to do. He forgot to tell someone to come pick him up. He forgot to arrange with the pilot to come back. And it's just a sad story. He was ill-prepared. He was trying to live life on his own terms when in fact, you know, hey, there's some rules uh, in the wild. There's some rules and things that you need to understand. And isn't that how it is in our culture? Everybody wants to live by their own rules. Everyone wants to live by their, you know, it's, I'm going to live life on my own terms. Uh, and to a certain extent, yeah, you can try to do the things you want, but guess what? There's a price to be paid. There's a price in the ultimate end uh, to be paid uh, for that. And so in studying this passage of Scripture, we're going to be looking at the church at Smyrna. It's a church that is persecuted. And when you read these passages of Scripture, I think it is an indictment on what is called the prosperity gospel which is very prevalent in our culture right now. In fact, you know, with all this COVID-19, you know, everybody's sitting at home streaming stuff. I watched a documentary called American Gospel in Christ Alone. American Gospel in Christ Alone. I encourage you, if you have Netflix, go look it up. If you have Netflix, watch that documentary because it points out this prosperity gospel is really not the gospel at all. This prosperity gospel is something that points away from Christ. And you know what? You probably listen to some of the people who are proponents of this. You know what we're talking about? It's that, that name and claim it type thing. If you can confess it, you can possess it. Uh, Bethel Church out of Southern California, uh, they do a lot of praise music, but they're a prosperity gospel. Hillsong, which you probably listen to some of their stuff, they're... Their church is a prosperity gospel. 
Joel Osteen, some of you probably have his books, is Prosperity Gospel. Kenneth Copeland, Prosperity Gospel. Creflo Dollar, Prosperity Gospel. Benny Hinn, Prosperity Gospel. And what is the, the underlying thing of the Prosperity Gospel is God doesn't want you to suffer. God just wants to bless you. You know, so you can have your best life now. This is what it points, points out to itself. No, that's not what the gospel is about. The gospel is about the fact that we are sinners separated from a holy and righteous God. And only the gospel of Jesus Christ can reconcile us to God. And it doesn't mean my life's going to automatically get better here and now. And in fact, if I become a believer in Christ in some places around the world, my life's going to get harder. My life is going to be very, very difficult. And that's what Jesus is telling the church at Smyrna. He's telling them, guess what? You're getting ready to have persecution. But this prosperity gospel, it's kind of like if you can think it, visualize it, and just speak it into existence yourself, then you can do it. And, and that's just heresy. No, only God can speak something into existence. Only God is the creator and sustainer. And so we recognize as we read this passage of scripture that the prosperity gospel is no gospel at all. So let's, in honor of God's word, if we would stand, we're going to read Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. He says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second day. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this passage of scripture. I pray that, Father, we would hear the message, that we would have the ears to hear, Lord, and the faith to respond. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So when we think about this, this church at, at Smyrna, and as we talked about before, these churches are actual churches. The first church that was on this road, uh, remember John is on the island of Patmos, has this vision, writes it down, sends somebody to take it. The first one it goes to is the church at Ephesus, uh, Ephesus being a very prominent city. Well, there was another city that was competing with Ephesus for who was the first city, which was the best city, and that was Smyrna. It was about 40 miles up the road from them. Smyrna had, actually had uh, places where they, had, they were well known for their Olympic type games. They had those things. But they were also known as being very loyal to Rome. Very loyal to Rome. Even before Rome had all of its, its power. And so uh, they were the first one to build a temple to the emperor. In fact, they competed with other cities to be one. Please let us build the temple to the emperor. So we can have em emperor worship. And so they were competing uh, for that. It was actually a city that had been burned down at one point in 500 B.C. Uh, 580 B.C., but then it had uh, been reborn, so to speak. So it's interesting when Jesus addresses them in verse 8. He says, And to the angel of the church at Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I just think the people in Smyrna kind of understood that our city was dead. Our city came back to life, so to speak. And it's interesting that Jesus would choose this to identify himself with them. To say that, guess what? There is, there is hope. Now, of all the churches uh, that are mentioned in this chapters 2 and chapter 3, Smyrna is the only city that is left. There's still an actual city of Smyrna. It's not called Smyrna. It's Ismir. It's, um, what's, again, modern-day Turkey. But um, the point is, this was a city that was very prosperous, extremely prosperous. But later, we're going to see that these believers were what? Actually, very poor and destitute. So when Jesus speaks to the church at Smyrna, he encourages them to what? Be aware of their circumstances. Be aware of their circumstances. Now notice this. Jesus does not condemn them for anything. Remember, Ephesus, they what? Had left their first love. 
they had done something wrong. They did some good stuff, but they had done something wrong and Jesus was correcting them. But here we see Smyrna, there's no condemnation, no. They are being faithful. And in fact, they have not left their first love. They're going through hardships and trials, and yet they're remaining faithful to God. And so Jesus says this, I'm aware of your circumstances, are you? Remember, he's the one who walks among the golden lampstands. He knows what is going on. And so he says, I'm aware of your circumstance, are you? And we need to look around and evaluate ourselves according to the word of God, not according to the world. Because in verse 9, it says, I know your works, your tribulation, and your poverty. That word for tribulation is like serious trouble. Serious trouble. Hardship. I mean, it is extreme. Uh, and it's just stated matter-of-factly, as if it's an ordinary thing. Kind of sounds like what Nick Ripkin talks about. Persecution is what is normal. Not being persecuted is kind of abnormal. Jesus just made it. I see your tribulation. And guess what? You're going to get some more. We'll talk about that in a minute. But he says, I know your situation, your works, and your tribulation. You know, this church at Smyrna had every reason to collapse. Its people are poor. And that word that is used there for poverty is not just poor like working poor. It's poverty like you're, you're begging. You have nothing. You have absolutely nothing. And I wonder if this early church had been totally ostracized by their community. If they were, had a Jewish background, they were ostracized by the Jews. If they were a Gentile background, they were ostracized, ostracized by the Gentiles. And he says, but I know your poverty, that they were what? Destitute. And this isn't just, um, just speaking in spiritual terms. He's talking, they really had nothing. But then he adds this, but guess what? You are rich. But you are rich. What rich in faith, James chapter 2, verse 5, mentions that. What be rich, what? In faith. They had faith. They didn't have anything else, probably just mainly the clothes on their back. But they had what? Faith. And he says, if you have faith, you have plenty. You have what you need. Faith, not just faith in faith, but faith in Jesus Christ. And so be aware of your circumstances, the tribulation. Guess what? We shouldn't be surprised if we suffer, especially if we suffer because we're a believer in Christ. Now, sometimes we may suffer because we do something foolish, right? Anybody here done something foolish? They, yeah, had to pay for it? Yeah. Well, you can't claim that as I'm being persecuted. No, you were just being foolish. No, you, you, you deserve what you got. There are times when, hey, we're making a stand for Christ and, you know, people uh, unfriend you on Facebook or say something bad about you. You know, you may experience a small level of persecution in that sense, but we're called to be faithful, to be rich in faith. Now, it's interesting. God knows Jesus sees their tribulation. And he knows the source of it. He says, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. He says they have Jewish heritage. He says, but they aren't really Jews. If they were truly Jewish, they would have embraced the Messiah. They would have embraced him to follow him. It's interesting that the Jews turned against the early church, blasphemed them, slandered them them, blasphemed against them, and it was called a synagogue of Satan. Satan is the adversary. He is the one who wants to a trip up. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And he says, I, I see what's happening. I'm, I'm aware and I understand this. I think it's interesting that in Smyrna, there was a man from church history. He's not mentioned in the Bible, but he was actually a disciple of the Apostle John. His name is Polycarp. Doesn't mean many fish. You know, Poly, Polycarp was his name. Uh, and he lived faithfully, but he was eventually martyred for his faith, burned uh, at the, uh, burned alive for his faith. 
And he said this, he said, 86 years I have served Christ and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Now when Jesus is writing this and telling this to John, and John is writing it down, it's saying there's a synagogue of Satan. It's these Jews and within several generations, what is it? The Jews are gathering wood on the Sabbath to martyr a Christian. That intense persecution didn't end, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It didn't just magically go away for the church at Smyrna. It didn't just disappear and dissipate. In fact, if anything, it didn't intensify. And that's because the adversary does not want the gospel to go forward. The adversary does not want to see Christ proclaimed. So when Jesus speaks to the church at Smyrna, he encourages them, what? To be aware of their circumstances. To know that, yeah, even though you're going through hard times, and even though, yes, you are poor, he says, you are rich in faith. Therefore, he can what? Tell them to what? Be courageous in the face of suffering. Be courageous in the face of suffering. In verse 10, he says, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Wait a minute. They just had suffering. You're telling them they're getting ready to have more suffering? I, no, wait. I didn't sign up for that. You know, when I became a follower, I thought it was going to be all easy and nice. No, no. He says, you're going to have more suffering. Do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil, and this is saying Satan and the devil are one and the same. Uh, Satan, the word means adversary. Devil, the word means slanderer, accuser. Uh, he is called the accuser of the brethren. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days, but be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Guess what? That's what's awaiting us. There's a crown of life. He says, yes, you may have hardships and trials in this life, but remain faithful. Stay true to Christ. Even in the midst of suffering, and guess what? He will give that, that crown of life. And so look at the uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Take a lesson from the life of the Apostle Paul. This is right after Paul has prayed three times that there would be a thorn in the flesh taken from him. He was like, you know, this adversary, this, he says that this thorn in the flesh would, would stop. But in verse 9, and he says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. <clears throat> Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Just think about that. The life of Paul, you couldn't get him down. Hey, we're going to throw him in a dungeon. Oh, really? i got more time to spend in my quiet time with God. You know, I mean, it's like he's, he's, he just embraces it. Not that he was out looking to suffer and needlessly doing that but when it came he began to look at it through the lens of what is God doing in the midst of this what is God telling me in the midst of this and he said therefore that again verse 10 I take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches in needs in persecutions in distresses for Christ's sake when you're going through a hard time if you turn that over to the Lord he's going to walk with you through that time May not take it away, but he is what? Certainly going to walk with you in that time. Because what? His strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, the more I am weak, then I'm strong. Strong how? Strong in the Lord. Strong in faith. So Jesus, in talking to the church at Smyrna, he tells them to be what? Courageous in the face of suffering. And again, he's facing, they're facing suffering from the Jews, from the Gentiles. And as a result, they are experiencing tremendous hardship. So when Jesus speaks to the church at Smyrna, he encourages them to be aware of their circumstances, courageous in the face of suffering, but also what? Faithful unto death. Faithful unto death. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcome, overcomes shall not be hurt 
by the second death. So he says, you guys have been faithful up to this point. You're getting ready to go in jail for 10 days. It's going to be severe. Be faithful. Now, some of these may have been put in jail because they were going to be what? Executed after 10 days, most likely. Maybe some of them were set free uh, afterwards. But regardless, for 10 days, he says, stay faithful. Stay faithful. But is it just 10 days we're supposed to stay faithful? No, it's every day. 24-7. All the time. We're to remain faithful in Christ. Uh, we're to count it all joy when we face various trials. He gives us what? The crown of life. I think it's interesting that in Smyrna, the skyline uh, around was almost like a crown that they could witness and, and see. And so reminding them of what this crown of life. And he who overcomes shall not be hurt. By the second death. Now we recognize that in heaven. There's again no more sorrow. But the fact that it will not be hurt. By the second death. Means that the second death is painful. <laughs> Extremely painful. Now all of us have been hurt. In one way or another. When you're a small kid. And you skin your knee. You get a what? It's called a boo-boo. Right? Or you get your elbow. And your mom can kiss it. And it's all better. You know that's, a, that's one level of hurt. Or you could get hurt and have a serious injury, break a bone or, or things like that and have to have surgery to, to fix that. Sometimes we can be hurt and have like a minor cold, uh, just a cough. Although in this day, anybody coughs, everybody's looking, do they have COVID? You know? I mean, it's kind of like, are you, you're freaking out if someone sneezes. Like, if you want to clear people out, go to a store and sneeze. And no, no one will stand near you, right? So... But, you know, there are major illnesses, though. I mean, you can have a minor cold and feel bad, but there's some people that have major illnesses, like cancer, those things that uh, will eventually take a life. You know, sometimes we can be insulted, going back to being like a child, what you would call a, a playground insult. It may hurt your feelings, and then by the end of the day, you forgot about it, you know, you moved on. But then there's other kinds of insults that will stay with you a lifetime. Even though you try to forget it and forgive, uh, those things hurt. Uh, they're, they're there. My point is, in this world, we have hurt. And you know what? For the believer in Jesus Christ, whatever hurt we're experiencing, whatever pain we may be enduring, there's a limit to it. And I don't know when we will take our last breath, but for the believer in Jesus Christ, we go from this world of pain and suffering immediately in the very presence of God and there's peace and there's no more sorrow there's no more hurting you know you can be in the most excruciating pain as a, a believer in Christ most excruciating painful experiences and in that moment that you pass from death to eternal life well eternal life starts the moment you receive Christ but when you leave this world and enter into the presence of God man there's again what a wonderful feeling Let's think about the second part of that. You know, think about that unbeliever, that person who doesn't know Christ, who does experience the second death. You say, what is the second death? What, what, what is that? I mean, what's, I thought you only could die once. Well, there is a, a physical death, obviously, and there is this second death that the Scripture speaks of. Those who are unbelievers. Those who have never trusted Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. They are lost and they are separated from God. They are what? Spiritually dead. And when they die, they are, are apart from God. And then there's coming a day when God is going to judge the nations. Let's look in Revelation chapter 20 real quick. Revelation chapter 20 because here in, in Chapter 2, it speaks of this second death. So what is the second death? Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. It says, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God in Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. I'll drop down to verse 14. 
Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone who was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know that hasn't happened yet. But let me just go back to that scenario I was saying. That person who's in pain and hurt right here and right now. And they are an unbeliever in Christ. They can be in the most excruciating pain. But when they leave this world, the pain just intensifies exponentially. Harder than we can truly comprehend or understand. And we sit there and think, really? God, I thought God's a loving God. I thought God didn't want anyone to perish. No, that's why he sent his son, Jesus. But did you ever stop to think about when Jesus died on the cross, what he was bearing? What he was taking on in himself when the sin of the world was placed upon him? He was taking everybody's head. Because God was what? Judging in Christ the sin of the world. And we must put our personal faith and trust in Christ. And we have to come to him on his terms, not on our terms. We can't sit there and think, well, I'm just a basically a good person. I've never really done anything bad. No, we, we must come to Christ on his terms. We must trust him fully and completely. So this church was persevering. They stayed strong. Again, they were commended for what they were doing. And the scripture says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. And he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And so we let us come to Christ on his terms. And, you know, going back to that story I was telling you at the beginning. Carl McCoon, McCoon, excuse me, Carl McCoon. He's dropped off in Alaska and he's having a great time, but he's keeping it <coughs> And so come about August, and August, we're still thinking it's hot here. Well, August, the temperature's changing in Alaska. And all of a sudden, he begins to write, I hope somebody remembers me. I, I hope somebody will, will come, and, and but surely people know that I'm here. But see, when he left, he told everybody, hey, I'm, I'm quitting my job. I'm going to be moving. And so all the people he had talked to just thought, well, he's back, and he's living somewhere else. But that's what he said he was going to do. And even his dad, he told his dad what he was going to do. And he told his dad, because he had gone off before, and, and his dad got worried and called the police. He said, Dad, don't do that. I'm okay. He, he told his dad. So his dad said, well, he told me not to call, you know. And even an airplane flew over his lake one day. As he's beginning to worry, he's beginning to, to fret. No one's going to find me. No one's really thinking about me. A state trooper in a plane flies over. But he had wheels. He didn't have the pontoon so he could land it. And so he flies over. And so he sees and he, he waves. Like, okay, this is it. The plane even turns around and comes back. And he's waving. He's actually got something in his hand. He's, he's waving. The plane turns around and comes back again. But by this time, he had walked on up to his camp. Because he's like, I'm going to go pack. And he's not running, he's not doing, he's just taking his time. Well, the, the state trooper saw him and thought, oh, okay, well, he's, he's all right. Well, later in his journal, he writes, he looks on the back of his hunting license. And in Alaska, if you're out in the wild and someone flies over, if you wave with one hand, you know what you're saying? Everything's okay. Don't need your help. Everything's okay. If you're in distress, you what? You raise two hands. Hey, if he'd done this, that guy would have radioed in and they would have come back. And that's when he realized, oh my goodness, nobody's coming back. Nobody's coming for me. It's a very sad story. I mean, it's one, he was ill-prepared and foolish. But you know what? He was trying to live life on his own terms. And I think it was also sad that Nobody was really looking for him. And I sit there and think about all the lost people in the world. Is anybody looking for them? Is anybody searching for them? Have you ever stopped to think that when you see someone out in public, when you see someone uh, on television, 
I wonder who's praying for that person. You know, there are a lot of places in this world where there's a very small Christian influence. And a missionary realized this one day as he's riding a train. And he looks around and he says, nobody's praying for that person probably. Think about this. You probably have somebody praying for you. Right? I think so, yes. You have somebody praying for you. Absolutely. If we want to take the gospel serious, we must understand that we come to God on His terms. We must understand that lostness is serious business. We can't take it for granted. We can't take it lightly. And so I just encourage you, like Jesus in church, encourage the church at Smyrna. Be aware of your circumstances. Be courageous. Be faithful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, and, and praise you for this time and this day. I ask that, Lord, you be magnified. Lord, as we just humble ourselves in your presence. Lord, thank you that someone was looking for us. Someone brought the gospel to us. Lord, thank you for this. And Lord, I believe maybe you put those Christians in Smyrna in jail so they could witness to somebody. You did that to the Apostle Paul. Put him in jail and the Philippian jailer and his family get saved. Lord, you work in ways that we don't comprehend. But Lord, we know that you work in this way. You desire your gospel to be proclaimed. You desire us to be faithful unto death. And Lord, if there's someone here today that's, Lord, just wavering, Lord, in their faith, just encourage them to, to stay true. Because, Lord, you're staying true. You're not leaving. You're not forsaken. Lord, forgive us when we have bought into the lie of the prosperity gospel. Because, Lord, it's popular. It looks successful. It looks like, wow, why are they being blessed by God and I'm not? When, in fact, that's just a false gospel, a false narrative. With many of your faithful followers, in fact, if you desire to live a godly life, you will suffer in this world. So, Father, give us wisdom to understand our circumstances. We may not understand them, but, Lord, we understand that you love us. So, Lord, if there's someone here today that just needs to surrender to you, I just pray, Father, they just say, Lord, just have your way in my life. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Lord, just remove my sin. I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus. Just ask that Jesus, you come into my life and Lord, cleanse me and make me a new person from the inside out. And Lord, I just want to live for you. And so Lord, that's our desire today. And just pray that during this time of invitation, we just surrender to you. And that Lord, we're not trying to do life on our own terms. And that Lord, we just raise both hands and say, Lord, we need you. We need your help. So, Father, we love you. Lord, we praise you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, again, for our invitation, since we're not asking you to come to the front just because of the social distance, I encourage you to respond to the Lord right where you are. And you will find a card uh, in front of you in the pew. And you can respond on the back, however God's speaking in your heart. Or if you just want to, uh, us to be praying over some issue, just put your name on there and email and just... Be happy to pray for you in whatever way. But during this time, just respond as God speaks to your heart. And just surrender to Him. And just, you need to raise both hands and say, God, I need you. I need you.